It's Luke chapter 7, verse 1. You can follow on the screens or in your own Bible. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There was a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly and was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him and say, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go. And he goes. And that one, come. And he comes. I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Good morning again. Uh, when we get that snow tonight, like they say that we might, just remember there are grown men playing baseball in Arizona and Florida. <laughs> Spring is on the way. Spring training is happening, and that's a really good thing, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, in, if you're a baseball fan, you know every spring, every team has their own hopes and aspirations, and what you're really hoping for is that somebody, uh, maybe unexpectedly, comes out of the blue, you know, and, and uh, sets the team on fire and makes the team and makes a big difference in the year. Uh, we're certainly hoping for that in Cardinal Nation, and maybe, uh, and that happens now and then, a dark horse candidate, a dark horse player, someone no one was expecting, uh, just sets the world on fire and just goes off from there. Most notable example in Cardinal history was uh, back in 2001, a guy that had been drafted in uh, the 13th round, like one of the 400th players uh, taken in that year's draft, uh, tried out for the team, and uh, just did incredibly well during spring training. The starting first baseman got injured. And Albert Pujols started first base the start of the first season and kept on playing for 11 years and had this amazing career. So we're all hoping for another Albert Pujols, right? That would be great. Um, and so uh, that happens sometimes. Well, today we're looking at a story from the Gospels that is about this dark horse, this guy who comes out of nowhere and displays this incredible faith. In fact, such amazing faith that Jesus is astonished at his faith. And um, again, no one saw it coming, especially from, from this guy. And so today we continue this series that we're calling Encounter. And what we're doing is we're looking at some of the healing stories of Jesus, um, not just the healings, although we are learning some things along the way about healing, but we're looking at the, the encounters that Jesus had with individuals and what it teaches us about faith and what it teaches us about him and God and our, our relationship with God. And so uh, we turn to Luke chapter 7 today. The story also appears in, in Matthew's gospel. And I think when we look at the story, we see three different ways presented to us. First of all, we see the typical way. And then we see the amazing way. And then when we look a little closer, we see the exceptional way. The ordinary way, the amazing way, the exceptional way. So Luke chapter 7, verse 1, we read this. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a little thriving village on the Sea of Galilee. It's no longer there except the ruins and the rubble as, there, as it's being rebuilt. Um, but this served as Jesus' headquarters when he was in his Galilean ministry. For, for, his, for those years there, he uh, based his operations out of Capernaum. So he would come and go. So here he is in, in his 
home base. And there, next verse, it says, There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. So we see the, the need and the problem. Now, a Roman centurion was an officer in the Roman army. They were named such because they commanded a century. In other words, a hundred, they had a hundred men under them. Um, they were expected to remain single until retirement, which meant about age 40. So if they had household servants, these household servants became like family to them. And this particular centurion had a servant who was very ill, about to die, and um, he was grieving this. And so this is the problem. So we'll go on to verse 3. It says, the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Uh, it says, when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. So there you see the problem and the, the attempted solution Jesus is uh, sent for because the centurion has heard of him. And um, interestingly, the folks who come to Jesus are, are Jewish religious leaders who know this man, have a relationship with this centurion, and they're friends. But notice, I want you to notice the appeal, the basis of the appeal. They say, this man deserves this. Why? Well, he's been good to our nation. Not many Roman soldiers were good to the nation. And he built our synagogue. That was pretty sizable financial commitment on his part. And he just poured out his uh, um, uh, appreciation for the Jewish people and, and his love for the, for the nation in, in doing this. But notice the language, he deserves this. He deserves to have this done. Why? I would say that this is the typical way. The typical way that uh, people approach religion. And it's sort of this, I call it the bargain. There's this bargain that's entered into, um, and that is this. I'll do my part if God will only do his part. And so, you know, I've got a church. I'll contribute some money, and, you know, I might even serve on a committee. But I expect God in return uh, to keep me healthy, to keep my family members healthy, to get me, to have me uh, keep a good job and the income coming in, and, and oh, about my kids, that they get straight A's and straight teeth would really be nice, so we don't have to go to the orthodontist, you know? And, and I want things to go smoothly for me. I want, I want things to just work out right in my life because that's God's part of the deal. And so we call this what? Quid pro quo. I do something for you, you do something for me. It's sort of the expectation. A lot of people live life like this. I'll, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. And so this happens in faith as well. And here's what happens. You can, you can, inevitably, you can tell somebody who, who is living their life. How do you know if you're living your life by the bargain? If something bad happens in your life, you feel let down by God. You feel disappointed. Now, wait a minute, we, we all... Hey, if you have a real relationship with God, just like if you have a real relationship with anyone else, there are going to be times you get angry with God. David, in, in the Psalms, he gets angry, and he expresses his anger, and that's a great place to express it to God, so you bring it out in the open and get healed. And I'm talking about a different kind of anger that comes from an expectation not met. It's like, God let me down. I went to church. I gave my money. I did this. I deserve better than what I'm getting in my life. Where was God? Why did he let me down? And what, what I've seen through the years as a pastor is you'll, folks with, who live their life on the bargain, when something, with this bargain, when something happens, what? They walk. God didn't keep his end of the deal. I'm out of here. That's rampant in Religion. It's this unwritten, unspoken sort of arrangement between us and God. And um, there's a better way. So, go back to the story. He, Jesus, was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, 
with soldiers under me, I tell this one go and he goes. I tell this one come and he comes. I tell my servant do this and he does it. So you get the picture, you know, Jesus is on his way to this, to, to this man's house to heal his, his servant when all of a sudden he gets word of what happened. Have you ever sent a message to somebody and they really bungle the message and they say the exactly opposite, exact opposite thing of what he did and say, no, I didn't want to say that. And they go to Jesus and say, he deserves this. And maybe word gets back to him and he say, no, I don't deserve this. It's not about deserving. And he sends this incredible reply. And we know it's incredible because look what happens next in verse 9. It says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. You know, there are only two times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we're told that Jesus was amazed at something that somebody did at their, at their faith. The other time was when he went to Nazareth, his hometown, and it was said he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, as you go to your hometown, you're just little Jesus, Right? You grew up there, you go back home, and I'm little Ronnie. You know, if anybody calls me Ronnie, they knew me before I was 13. You know, you don't have any respect there. So Jesus goes back to Nazareth, and it says uh, he wasn't able to do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and see them recover. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So that's not how you want to amaze Jesus. But here, the only other time we're told that Jesus was amazed was he was amazed at their faith at the faith of this centurion. What what do you think amazes him about about this guy? I see three things at least. First off, he's a Gentile. He's not on the home team. I mean, he wasn't raised in the synagogue. He wasn't told the stories about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He wasn't told the incredible stories of Moses and how Moses went to Egypt and, and, and God set all of his people free from slavery and, and all of these stories that helped build our faith that we learn in Sunday school and about the ways and, and the, the works of God. He didn't have any of that. So where did he learn? How did he get such incredible faith? It's, it's, it's astonishing, really. Um, and then other thing I think that amazes Jesus is his humility. They say, you know, he deserves this. He says, I don't deserve this. It's not about me deserving anything. It's not about me. Another sign you get of his humility was when he says, he talks about authority. He says, he, first he says, I'm a man under authority. Centurions weren't, you know, they weren't the generals. They weren't in charge. But he had 100 men under him. Instead of seeing himself first as a man with authority over others, he says, I am a man under authority. I think Jesus was amazed at his humility. It was rare in those days. In fact, you know, in the Roman world, humility was seen as a vice. Humility was seen as a weakness. It was only until the teachings of Jesus and the church came along that people began to see humility as a virtue and something to aspire to. And here's this Roman, this Roman soldier, this centurion, the last person you would expect to be humble, and he's he's humble. I think Jesus is amazed at his humility. And then thirdly, his understanding of of authority and how this relates to Jesus. He says, I'm a man under authority, and I've got soldiers under me, and I tell them to go do this, and they do it. Go get this done, and they get it done. What is he really saying? He's saying, I I recognize the authority that you have, Jesus, and that you don't even have to be present. I mean, as a centurion, he could get orders from 50 miles away, and he's going to do it because, you know, that's, that's the way it works. And he can give orders long distance. And what he's saying is, Jesus, if you order it to be done, it's going to get done. And you don't even have to be in my roof. Just say the word. And Jesus is just utterly amazed. Wow. It takes a lot to get Jesus to say, wow. That's a newer translation version. <laughs> but he does. Um, this man had a different approach to faith. And, and again, it's like, where did he get this? And I, I think that, 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 that Jesus goes with him because he wants, to, he wants to, to meet this man. Um, he prayed boldly, boldly, didn't he? You know, sometimes our our prayers lack boldness. 
Sometimes we'll come to God and we'll say, you know, God, I might like you to do this for me, but I, you may not want to do it, and, and it may be too much to ask. I know you're really busy, and, and besides, this may be impossible, and, and uh, well, just, just your will be done, and, and I, I don't know. And, and we kind of stumble around, and we hesitate, and we're timid, and we, and we don't want to pray because you know why? Sometimes we don't want to pray bold prayers because if we think they don't come true, we're going to be disappointed in our faith. And so we pray timidly, but not this guy, not at all. See, and also, amazing faith not only prays boldly, but amazing faith understands that there are different ways that God answers prayer. Some people say, man, I prayed and prayed, and God never answered my prayer. No, 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 God always answers prayer. Sometimes the answer is no. It's like a kid who asks their, their parents for something. I mean, we, we sometimes say no to our kids, Right? Thank God my mom said no to me on some things. I would have been a disaster at it had she said yes to some of those things. And so sometimes God's answer is yes, and it, and it happens. And then sometimes it's no, but people of amazing faith, they're okay with that. They understand that sometimes God says, wait, you're not ready for this yet. Um, amazing faith recognizes and understands that it's not about what happens. It's about who we're putting our faith in. You see, where was this guy putting his faith? He was putting his faith in Jesus. And he really doesn't even talk about the outcome. Kind of an insight on faith. Uh, John Calvin was one of the original uh, reformers along with Martin Luther in the Protestant Reformation. And then John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement. John Wesley and John Calvin are often seem to be opposites when it comes to the, the history in the Protestant movement. Uh, Calvinists trace the roots back to John Calvin and Methodists and other Wesleyans trace their roots back to Wesley. And a lot of theological differences between the two, but when it came to faith, they understood it the same. I like their definitions. John Wesley said this about faith. He says, faith is a conviction of God and the things of God. In other words, faith is a conviction of the goodness of God. John Calvin said it this way, faith is a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us or Faith is, is, a, is a trust in God's goodness to us. Notice something that's missing in both of those definitions, any reference to the outcome. It's not so much about the outcome that we are praying for, it's the person that we are praying to. You know your faith is only as good as the object that you're placing your faith in. If you place your faith in something not worthy of your faith, then you'll be disappointed and, and it, it's not gonna work well. When I was 16 years old, like anyone else, I was uh, so excited about driving. I got my driver's license on my birthday and got a car, my first vehicle. So excited about this was a 1972 AMC Hornet. Some of you laughing, no, you're my generation and you remember what an awful automobile company AMC Hornet was. Uh, AMC was, it stood for American Motor Corporation. I had other uh, uh, words for those uh, acronyms. Um, and and I, I bought this car. You say, some of you younger say, I've never heard of that company. Exactly. They've been out of business a long time ago, and they, a long time, and they deserve to go out of business. They made some of the worst cars. I'm sorry if you're related to somebody who used to work for AMC, but I mean, they made miserable cars and funky cars too. You remember the Pacer? It was a really fat car, you know? And uh, you didn't have one, did you? You did. All right. Good going, Wendell. Uh, and then maybe you had, remember the Gremlin? The Gremlin was like a real car, except the back half was cut off. Well, I had a Hornet, which was a Gremlin, which was the whole thing, okay? And all of them had one thing in common. They were terribly unreliable. They broke down all the time. I learned more about the internal combustion engine than I ever wanted to know because everything that would, could go wrong with an engine went wrong with my Hornet. Never forget the time that I'm driving through my neighborhood and there's this clunk noise, you know, underneath you hear those noises like, oh, that's not good. And, and I see behind me this trail of fluid. I'm thinking, what is that? It was transmission fluid and my, in, my transmission burned up. And I came to, I take it the mechanic, he says, yeah, he says, I guess the engineers at AMC, they, they didn't have a, a tube go, to, go long enough to carry the transmission fluid. And so like they two came together and they, they put them together with a, a rubber hose. Who does that? Companies like that go out of business. So, you know, I was a terrible car to place my faith in as a, as a 16-year-old. And so, what are you putting your faith in? See, faith in Jesus is faith well-placed. You put it in, in crystals or uh, astrology or tarot cards, you're putting your faith in the wrong spiritual stuff. Put your faith in Jesus. That's the right place to put it. And see... Therefore, you can trust him regardless of the outcome, 
regardless of what happens in response to faith. You see, people of faith know that God and his timing is always going to do good. God is going to work good on our behalf. And so a bold prayer can be, God, I ask that this would be done. And you pray boldly for that to get done. And you say, you know, no matter what happens, I'm going to trust you. And if it takes all of human history for this thing to be realized, I trust that you are good and your ways are always good to me because we believe that God is good all the time, right? Just to say that, I'll say it. God is good all the time. Yeah, God is good all the time. Yeah. And see, real faith, amazing faith, really truly believes that, that it's not so much about the outcome right now, it's about what God is going to do. And we can trust his character, we can trust that he has our back, we can trust that he always has our best intentions in mind, that he loves us. I think the story is telling us that amazing faith is trusting in Jesus' goodness no matter the outcome. And so next weekend, we, are, uh, we scheduled a healing service. Now, we've done these over the years a number of times, but I uh, don't believe we've ever done one on the weekend, okay? So I just want to tell you a little bit about what to expect next weekend. First off, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Bob Tuttle. Bob has been here a number of times to preach, and he's a character. He's a scholar. He's a, a retired seminary professor who still teaches seminary, and uh, he is a mentor to several of us LaCroix pastors down through the years, me and Brad, as, as well as others. Um, a remarkable guy, remarkable character, and you're going to love Bob Tuttle, and he's a gifted preacher. But another thing you need to know about Bob Tuttle is that he, God gave him the spiritual gift of healing. Now, we believe that there are spiritual gifts and that God gives these gifts uh, to people, and he gives these, pe- these gifts so that we can use these gifts to serve one another. Spiritual gift of healing is a special ability God gives certain members of the body of Christ to pray for others and to see them recover apart from medical means. Now, we believe in medicine, and we believe in that God heals through all kinds of avenues and that he uses medicine, and he uses the medical community, and he uses the accumulated wisdom of the, of, of, of the uh, human community to bring about healing, but that ultimately God is the great physician. He's the one who brings healing. And, and some people have the gift of healing where they pray. It's not like every time they pray someone's healed, but they They see people, they see things happen. Tell you a little um, personal experience I had. Last year, went on a uh, trip to the the Holy Land. We're going to be going on another one. We'd love to have you go. But when I was there, we're doing baptisms in the Jordan River, and uh, next day I pull my back out, all right? And I mean, it goes way out. I've, I've battled a herniated disc for years, and um, sometimes I have trouble with it. And it, it went out really bad, and I wasn't paying attention to it, and it, it got so bad I had to stay at the hotel. I got to where I could hardly walk. Uh, I finally get home. I get physical therapy for about six weeks, and it's, you know, slowly improving. It was... It was um, you know, taking a while, but I had to get ready because I was going on another trip, this time with Bob Tuttle, uh, for his last Wesley Heritage tour. He d- he's done these tours over the years to go to England and go to all the places where John Wesley had gone, and I thought I wanted to do this because this was going to be his last time. I never had that opportunity. So I go on this trip, but I'm kind of worried in the back of my mind, you know, what happens if my back goes out again? And sure enough, about five days in the trip, it went out. I had to stay back in the hotel, and I'm really bummed out about this. And so that night at dinner, I sit next to Bob, And he says, can I pray for you? He lays hands on my back. Well, my back was really hurting bad. There was a person on the trip who was a nurse, and she had some uh, really strong uh, painkillers, and I took those the next day. And by the second day, I thought, you know, I don't think I need those. I'll just take maybe Tylenol, ibuprofen, or whatever. And by the end of the third night, my back was back to normal. It had taken six weeks before to barely get back to normal. And all I can say is that God did something, and my back hasn't gone out since. Now, I've also prayed, and I've had people pray for me, and the back hasn't uh, responded. Healing is a mystery. But as Bob says, we don't want, no one should be sick because they haven't been prayed for. So we pray, we believe, and we trust and so next week, uh, we're going to have healing service, and, and some of you think, oh, is it going to be weird? No, it's not going to be weird. It's going to be typical LaCroix kind of weekend. Bob's going to preach. We're going to have communion. During communion, people are going to come to the front, and there's going to be stations for, for prayer, and Bob's going to be one of those praying. There'll be others praying, and we're going to anoint people with oil, as the Scriptures say, and we'll, we'll pray. And we'll pray boldly, and we'll trust God no matter the outcome. 
And so I'm looking forward to that with real expectation. The amazing way, trust God. Trust the heart of Jesus, no matter the outcome. And I said that this story shows us three kind of ways. There's the typical way, the, the, the sort of bargaining with God, and then there's the, the, the amazing way where we're trusting in God and not depending on our, what we deserve. It's not about what we deserve. It's about who God is and his goodness. I said also in this story, though, there's the, the exceptional way. And this is the part of the story that many of us miss because, well, we're 2,000 years removed from the culture. But let me tell you, this part of the story would have jumped out at anybody in the first century because it was the most striking feature of this particular story. And what is that? That the hero of the story, the good guy, is the bad guy, a Roman soldier. Roman centurions, Roman soldiers in general, Roman people were hated by the Jews, and yet here is a man who not only becomes the hero of the story, but he was loved by the Jewish population. Absolutely stunning situation here. In fact, um, he got connected with the community, served the community, underwrote the financial uh, construction of the synagogue, I mean, gave sacrificially. And I think when, when Jesus is asked to go meet him and they tell him about this, he, he's not paying attention to the, the he deserves it line. He's, he, I want to meet this guy. There aren't many people who cross racial boundaries and racial divides. We kind of tend to stay in our own communities, you know, and mistrust and, and, and uh, um, doubt one another in other communities. But this guy steps across the line. I think pretty helpful word for us because we live in a day, do we not, where there are a lot of racial tensions. There are a lot of racial divisions in our country, serious ones. The good news is that there were even more serious ones in the first century. And here's an example of somebody who crossed the chasm, of somebody who crossed the great divide. And again, some in the first century, would have, this would have been the most striking feature of the story. More than his faith, more than the healing, more than anything else was the fact that here is a guy who was loved by the Jewish community, who loved them. You see, Jews hated the Romans, the Romans hated Jews. The typical Roman soldier, they despised local populations where they were sent to work and looked down upon them as racially inferior. That was typical. But here's this guy who loves the local population. He becomes the exception. You see, Jewish people saw Romans as oppressors, and here's the exception to the rule. Craig Keener is a um, theologian and, and um, uh, author of commentaries, and on his commentary about this particular story, he's also a professor at Asbury Seminary, he, he says this, he says, exceptions can make a difference. And he tells a story about a man he knew, a white pastor growing up in the South, who went through a very traumatic season in his life and was struggling spiritually and emotionally and even physically. And he got connected to a black Baptist church. And the folks in this church welcomed him and embraced him and surrounded him with much love and grace, and they nursed him back to health spiritually and emotionally. He became so connected with the people of that church that he was beginning to see what it, might like, what it would be like to, to have black skin in America and what it was like for them. Um, he became so connected with the community that he got ordained in the Black Baptist Church to serve in that community. One day in Sunday school, when one of the teachers was, was talking, he makes, a, he makes a comment, kind of a generalization about the white community, and he's taken back, and he's sort of um, offended by it. He took it personally. And the teacher said, whoa, 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 I didn't mean you. You're my brother. You see, this guy had crossed the divide. You know what we need today in this era of polarization and strife and racial divisions, we need people who will be the exceptions to the rule, 
who can step into communities that are different from them politically, socioeconomically, racially, culturally, all of those things and bridge the guide. You see, the exceptions believe that the racial divides that we have can be overcome. They can be. If we step into that different culture. And that's certainly what this centurion does. And wow, what an exceptional story. Incredible story. So, the typical way, the amazing way, the exceptional way. When you look at your faith and the fabric of your faith, would you say it's built more in a bargain with God that, hey, I'll do this stuff as long as you come through for me? If so, you'll, you'll be disappointed because stuff will happen. Dark clouds will form, storms will hit, and difficulties will arise. And if you're living your life by the bargain, your faith won't make it. What if you stepped over to the amazing way? It says, I trust the goodness of God. I trust his heart. I trust that he, that, he, that he loves me. I trust that Jesus is all powerful and that if I pray and I ask for something, he's going to work it out. He's going to do what is absolutely best for me if it takes all of human history to accomplish it because he's that good. See, a faith like that, it can be rocked, but it cannot be destroyed. So I invite you on to this amazing path. Oh, look at how the story ends. It says, Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the heart of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, this story and about this, uh, this guy, this centurion, this, this dark horse who comes out of nowhere and just puts on an incredible display of faith. And yet it's also humble enough to recognize that it's not about him and it's not about deserving. It's about who you are, Jesus. I pray for those in our midst who may be living their life by the bargain, this sort of contract with God. Lord, I pray that they'll see the emptiness of that approach and that they'll learn to trust your goodness, your goodness that is displayed on the cross your goodness that is seen in the empty tomb and your goodness that is seen in your involvement in our lives in the life and the ministry of Jesus. So thank you, Father. Give us faith, increase our faith, strengthen our faith so that we can believe and trust in you no matter what. For we pray in the name of Jesus who came and across that great divide to bring us to his side, to bring us to salvation. For we pray in the name of Jesus, amen.